Welcome to another true crime story time where I tell you one true crime case that was solved using forensic science all while doing, and that's right, my makeup. Please read the disclaimer, I am not a professional forensic pathologist, nor am I a professional makeup artist. I'm just the average girl at home, like you, about to choke. <coughs> Excuse me. I need to take a breath. I am just the average girl at home, like you, playing in my makeup and talking about a true crime case. So if that's something you're into, then you are more than welcome to stick around and hit the subscribe button. Also, quick reminder, the comment section is a privilege. Don't fuck it up. Now let's get into today's case. This story all takes place in September of 2000 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where 20-year-old single mother Christina Sauspain lived with her son. Christina was an aspiring journalist who had recently moved into a new duplex in Cedar Rapids. Now on September 4th of 2000, four days after Christina had moved into her brand new apartment, a friend of hers, 23-year-old Todd Hale, stopped by to do a wellness check on her. I'm gonna get into why he stopped by to do this wellness check a little bit later. There's some things that was going on in Christina's personal life that prompted him to do these welfare checks on her, but let's continue with the story. Um, after numerous attempts of ringing the doorbell and banging on the door and no one answering, he tried to enter the home through the front door, but the door was locked. Like obviously this guy thought that whatever was going on in Christina's life, it prompted him to feel like he needed to do these types of things. After multiple attempts with no luck, he went around the side of the house and appeared through one of the bedroom windows. That is when he saw Christina's son, her little son, sitting on the floor in the bedroom, playing with toys and crying and the TV was on. Something obviously was wrong. There is no way that Christina would have left her son alone in that bedroom just crying. According to Todd, he says that he heard Christina's son say, mommy is dead, and that prompted him to then go ahead and enter the home. He was able to break open the screen and crawl through the window. Once inside, he began looking for Christina. He was calling out to her, but he got no response. His search ended when he got to the bathroom, and that is where he made a gruesome discovery. Christina Christina's lifeless body was laying in the tub in a pool of blood and I mean it was a bathtub full with water and she was laying face down he didn't try to save her because it was clear that she was already gone she was deceased Todd ran next door to get help he asked the next door neighbor to call 911. Now Todd went to this specific neighbor's house because he had known this neighbor. He met him a couple of days earlier on. He met him four days earlier when he was helping Christina move her things into the apartment. So the neighbor calls 911. He tells police, hey, you gotta get out here quick. My neighbor is dead. Paramedics and police arrive on the scene and they pronounce Christina dead. There was no sign of forced entry, which usually is an indication that the victim knew their killer. We got some pimples to cover up today, girl. They large and in charge too, honey. We gotta get them out of here. The front door was locked, nothing was broken, nothing was taken, so it wasn't, it wasn't looking like a robbery. When Christina was discovered, she was partially nude, which led investigators to believe that this was a sexually motivated attack rather than a robbery gone wrong. It appeared as though she had been stabbed to death before being placed into the tub of water, possibly to wash away any evidence that the killer may have left behind. There was so much blood, you guys. It was spread all over the floor. It was a very gruesome crime scene. There was bloody footprints that led out into the kitchen and then back into the bathroom and then out again. Whoever the killer was, he was walking all around that house, girl. He was like doing his thing. I don't know. He was making himself at home. Maybe, I, girl, who knows what this man was doing or woman. Let's not be biased here. As investigators continued to search the home, 
They found Christina's sandals in the kitchen in the middle of the floor. One detective said that the way her shoes were positioned in the center of the kitchen made it look like she had been smacked straight out of her shoes, like she had been hit very hard. Then they discovered a silver metal collar that they believe had come from a frying pan. It was like, you know, one of the little collars or is it a collar? Is Would the handle of a frying pan be considered the neck? I don't know. I don't know. I would have called it a bracelet, but then now we're getting into giving the frying pan arms, necks, and legs. God knows what's next. So we're going to stay away from that. They said it was a collar. I'm going to stick with it being a collar. You guys know what I'm talking about. The little piece of metal that connects the um, handle to the actual frying pan. That's what they discovered. They also found three of Christina's teeth laying on the floor. I mean, it was obvious that Christina had been hit with the frying pan so hard that it knocked her out of her shoes and also knocked her teeth out. Oh, that's crazy. You know what the sad thing is, is that all while this was happening, her kid was in the house and he was awake and he knew all of this. I feel so bad for the kid and I just wonder where the kid is now, if he's doing okay, like going because this is traumatizing. It's just like the most disturbing thing ever. I accidentally squirted out way too much product per usual. <laughs> and now I'm sitting here trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with all this product. And I guess we're just gonna apply it to my face. <laughs> now the bloody footprints that they found in the kitchen were bear prints. So whoever the assailant was had entered the home barefoot. Um, that's weird, like why? Why though? I don't know. Oh no, we're looking like Ronald McDonald. <laughs> there was also signs that the assailant had tried to clean up the crime scene, but in doing so had left some prints behind. Although it appeared as though Christina had been stabbed to death, they were unable to locate the murder weapon. They did though find a bloody palm print on the side of the bathroom tub, which was a major clue to who the assailant could have been. What is that? Is that my hairline? Oh my God, I think I should just, should I just shave that? I don't know. As if the bare footprints wasn't enough, in the midst of all of this, crime scene investigators find something even more bizarre. Investigators find hamburger buns scattered about on the bathroom floor. Don't tell me this man was trying to make himself a burger. I mean, Considering the tracks back and forth to the kitchen, don't tell me this man sat down after he murdered this girl and made himself a burger. Do not, do not tell me that because that's very, very disturbing. So these hamburger buns that they found in the bathroom were fresh. So it appeared as though the buns were fresh buns that have been scattered about on the floor. I guess this man thought he was gonna make himself a sandwich. I, I don't know, like, who knows why people do the freaking weird shit that they do, like nobody knows. Now, although they found these hamburger buns on the floor, they did not find a bag for the hamburger buns, which they thought was weird. They found the tie to the bag for the hamburger buns on the bathroom floor as well. So what happened? Did he just, did he have himself a burger, took the bag with him? Did he, what happened? We don't know, um, like nobody, Everybody was like, this is such a bizarre thing that nobody knew what to think. So based on the crime scene, the hamburger bonds and the bloody trails, investigators theorized that the assailant was trying to cover his tracks. And the fact that he was barefoot also told them that he most likely lived nearby. I mean, he couldn't leave the murder weapon there, right? He had to take it with him, but he didn't want to leave a trail leading back to his place. So he put the knife in the hamburger bun bag and that would explain the reason why the hamburger bun bag was missing and the knife was missing. This was all investigators' theories, of course. That is the cockamamie stuff. Like how the heck you do all of that to ensure that you don't leave a bloody trail behind from the knife, but you, you leave bloody footprints. Bare footprints too. So that is not like a shoe impression. It's an actual footprint of yours. I mean, not the smartest out there, huh? <laughs> Why do they do this? They're go you're gonna get caught, babe. You're gonna get caught. 
there's always clues left behind and even if they don't catch you now and they don't figure it out now they can figure it out years down the road so just don't do it that's the answer investigators ran a background check on christina they wanted to find out if she had any known enemies or anyone who would want her dead and the first suspect that popped up was christina's ex-boyfriend and father of her son jacob hadley this is normal police procedure. They like to rule out the person closest to the victim, any family members, friends, or significant others. Also statistics show that most murders occur between a victim and a significant other, someone that they knew. So they run this background check on Christina and Jacob and they learn that Christina met Jacob her senior year in high school. Now, Christina was an aspiring journalist and she was well on her way to becoming that. She always dreamed to be a journalist until she met Jacob. That is when her parents say that she fell in with the wrong crowd. She started partying a lot, drinking, doing drugs, and hanging out with her, her ex, Jacob. Girl, stay away from these boys. Stay away from these boys. And notice I said boys, not man. Ooh, girl, I don't know what's going on with my, ooh, we gotta pat that out. When she found out she was pregnant, she moved in with Jacob and that's when all of the trouble started. That's when all of the abuse started. Jacob would regularly hit Christina and Christina was pretty open about the abuse. In fact, when family members and friends would see the bruises on her, they would ask questions about it and she would say, oh yeah, Jacob hit me. Like she was, she was very, very open and vocal about the abuse. Everybody knew that Jacob had, would abuse her and would hit her. So girl, just leave, just leave, okay? I know it's not that easy. It's a lot easier said than done. Trust me, I know. Sadly, I've been in the situation before in the past. I'll never be there again, but I did have to go through something like that and it took something like similar to that situation for that to never be my story again guys if anything learn from these stories learn from the victims learn from the the killers learn whatever you can from these stories these stories are not just to you know for entertainment they're also f lessons for you guys to learn like if you take anything away from my videos and my storytelling take the lesson okay and I know it's hard to hear because most of the times we want to make sure everybody feels comfortable and safe and, you know, to express and explore themselves or what the hell ever. Like, we just want to make sure we're not offending anybody and I don't want to offend anyone. But guys, you got to see the lessons in these stories. Don't let this be you. Needless to say, the two had a very volatile relationship. Christina would document her struggles, the abuse and everything in the journal of hers that would later be discovered by investigators. She wrote some interesting passages in that journal. In the journal inserts, she described how he would always put her down and make her feel worthless. So along with physical abuse, he was also emotionally and mentally abusing her. She also expressed in a journal her desire to leave the relationship, which I think that might have been the motive. She said that after three years, she realized that she was the only one that was in love, that he was never in love with her. She wanted a fresh start. She did not want to continue in the relationship anymore. You guys are going to have to be nice to me today because my eyebrows, girl, you already know. If you've been here for a while, you already know the struggle. They are just different and they will always be different. Excuse me, can you not cough while I'm in the middle of filming? Sir, neighbor. Go into your apartment, please. These people. As though I'm the only one who has a life. <laughs> Typical Aries behavior. According to Christina's mother, Christina had a very difficult time leaving Jacob. Although she was done with the abuse, she would oftentimes go back to him. And when her mother would ask, why do you keep going back to him? Why don't you just like leave him leave him christina she would tell her mom mom i love him i i can't leave him mom i will never leave him i love him um the abuse had gone so far that one day jacob shot christina in the face with a pallet gun yeah no words like no words i would have killed that motherfucker if christina was my daughter 
I would have killed him. Jacob spent only three months in jail for his crime. It just feels like this girl just can't get a break. She had decided to leave this guy, start off fresh. She got a brand new duplex, living on her own with her son. And now this, four days later, after she finally was free of this guy, she's murdered. I mean, just the circumstantial evidence alone in this case points directly to Jacob, 110%. Motive, opportunity, and get this, guys. Jacob lived only a couple of miles away from Christina, because obviously she has his son, they're sharing custody. She's not like she can jump up and move to another state because she has his son. With all of this information, Jacob Hadley becomes investigators' prime suspect in the case. An autopsy report revealed evidence of a she had a blunt force trauma to the lower side of her mouth as well as the right side of her head. She had a laceration on the lower left side of her lip. A couple of her teeth were missing and had been knocked out. I mean, it's I just my teeth, not my teeth, not my teeth, please. She had a hemorrhage contusion and a laceration over her right temple area. She had massive lacerations to the neck. Her left corroded artery had been cut. Her trachea had been severed. She endured traumatic injuries to her connective tissues and vessels. Her cause of death was massive blood loss secondary to the neck wound. She lost so much blood that the forensic pathologist was unable to perform a toxicology report on her because they didn't have any blood to test. That's how much blood she lost. I mean, <gasps> an x-ray of Christina's head showed the pellet in her face where her ex-boyfriend Jacob had shot her just months prior to her murder. Friends and family members also thought that Jacob was most likely the killer because of all of this. I mean, that pellet in her face was just a stark reminder to investigators why Jacob was their prime suspect. Research has shown that the most dangerous time for a domestic violence victim is when they decide to leave the relationship, when they decide to end things with their abusers. That's when their lives are basically on the line. And we know that Christina was planning to do that. She had already made plans to leave Jacob. When investigators questioned Jacob about Christina's murder, he told them that he was actually out having drinks with friends that night around the same time that her murder was supposedly had taken, that her murder had supposedly taken place. For obvious reasons, investigators wanted to talk with Jacob and they went down and picked him up real quick and they brought him into the police station for questioning. When investigators questioned Jacob about the night of Christina's murder, he told them that he was out with friends having a drink that night and that he had witnesses who could corroborate his story. And sure enough, Jacob brought in these witnesses who said that they had been hanging out with him all night. It was actually, I think, two or three girls from their women's sport team at the university that they all went to. This man should not even be allowed to be anywhere near any women. The women were from the Iowa State track team. They were very credible witnesses who were able to cooperate his story. They said that he was there with them for most of the night, drinking and hanging out. But Christina's autopsy report stated her time of death between the hours of 9.30 p.m. and 3 a.m. And that's a lot of time. And there was a portion of time that Jacob wasn't accounted for, that he wasn't off the hook just yet. There was just a couple of things throwing investigators off about the Jacob theory. One thing was that his son was in the house and they just couldn't see him doing that to his son's mom while she was still in the house and just leaving the baby there and not comforting the baby and they just couldn't see him doing that. It just didn't make sense for a father to do that. Also, um, the bare footprints, like why would he be walking around barefoot? That really didn't make sense for Jacob because he lived miles away from Christina. I believe they said he lived about 20 to 30 minutes away from Christina. So there was no way he was about to walk. Just, it doesn't make any sense. It, it wouldn't make any sense at all. Although all the circumstantial evidence pointed to Jacob, 
the actual physical evidence kept pointing elsewhere. It was pointing to it being someone that lived nearby. So investigators turned their attention to the two men that had discovered Christina dead that day. They hadn't initially thought of the two men because, well, they called the police and they were trying to get Christina help. But now they were having second thoughts about these guys and thinking, you know what? Maybe we should look into them. Maybe they had something to do with it. Police was now thinking that it may have been a ploy to distract them away from them. The fact that they called the police to make it look like they were innocent and trying to help out. Now, the two men did know each other. Like I said before, they had met three days earlier helping Christina move in. 23-year-old Todd Hale was the one who had initially discovered Christina's body, so they wanted to talk with him first. When investigators questioned Todd, he said that he had gone over to Christina's to do a welfare check. He said that with everything she had been going through, he just was trying to be a good friend and support her any way that he could, and I'm pretty sure he was trying to, he was probably trying to spit some game too but that's all right, sir. When Christina didn't answer the door and he could see her son inside playing, he broke in through the window, climbed inside, and that's when he discovered Christina. Investigators just had one problem with his story. It is how he got through the window without knocking anything off the entertainment system that was set in front of the window. So in front of that window, there was an entertainment system with a TV on it. There was also a lot of other knickknacks on this entertainment system. So it was a very small space in between the window and this entertainment system. And police was just wondering how the heck a man got in through that window and he was a fit guy. He was a big guy. It wasn't like he was super small or anything. They asked him if he would go back to the crime scene with them and demonstrate how he had gotten into Christina's home. And he agreed, he went back with them. Investigators watched as he popped the screen off and snaked his way into the window effortlessly. I mean, this guy was so smooth. He didn't budge any of the knickknacks on the entertainment system or the TV at all. I mean, he was... He was good. Made the investigators a little bit uncomfortable, if you know what I mean. They were thinking, are we looking at ourselves a professional burglar here? I mean, sir, you popped that a little too well, okay? I mean, even though he looked a little suspicious for being able to get inside the apartment so easily, nonetheless, they didn't have a motive for him. They didn't have really any solid evidence that he had done it, so he checked out pretty good. Next, investigators interviewed Christina's neighbor, Carlos Robinson. He was the one who had made the 911 call. I mean, he did live next door to her, so that was relatively close. He had been inside of her apartment a couple of days earlier when he was helping her move. So, I mean, it's a possibility he also knew her routine and was able to get in. So they bring Carlos Robinson in and he is very cooperative with investigators, very polite. He gives them a routine statement and as investigators exit the interview room, that is when they notice some bizarre behaviors from Carlos. You see, Carlos was unaware that the interview room was being recorded. Ha ha ha. I don't know how, everybody knows that the interview room is recorded. How could you? This is what I mean by criminals being just dumb. And as soon as investigators left the room, Carlos did something very strange. He dropped to his knees and started praying. Definitely not the behaviors of someone who is not guilty. I mean, he could have just decided it was time to make a prayer. I don't know. Maybe, I mean, maybe Carlos was just, he was just a nice Christian guy. He was exhibiting signs of someone who may have had a guilty conscience. Now investigators had three suspects in Christina's murder, but who had actually done it? Was it the abusive ex-boyfriend, the praying neighbor? or the friend who was checking up on her. They needed scientific evidence to prove who the killer was. I'm actually really happy with this look. <gasps> Girl. Girl. I'm surprised at myself. So they had the footprints from the crime scene, right? And they also had that palm print that was left on the side of the tub. 
So next, what they did was bring all three men in for foot impression testing. Fit impression testing? For footprint testing. The first suspect they took impressions from was Todd. Todd was very cooperative. They inked the bottom of his feet. They told him to walk across one side of a long sheet of paper. Then they re-inked his feet and told him to walk down the opposite side of this long sheet of paper. And Todd was very cooperative. He did exactly as the investigators instructed. The results came back and the footprints did not match Todd and he was cleared as a potential suspect. Next, they took footprints from Jacob, the abusive ex-boyfriend. They inked Jacob's feet and asked him to do the same exact thing, to walk down one side of this long sheet of paper, ring the bottom of his feet and told him to walk down the, the opposite side of the sheet of paper. And Jacob complied. He did everything that investigators told him to do. He was super cooperative. I know he was trying to be on his P's and Q's because all the crap that he had already done to this girl, he knew they was looking at him. They sent his prints out to the lab. The results came back and the prints did not match. Jacob was not the killer. That is the first time I'm saying that shocked. I don't know anybody else that fit the profile as much as Jacob does like lastly they brought in Carlos and Carlos was not cooperative at all so investigators asked him to do the same exact thing they had instructed the other two men to do but Carlos for whatever reason was acting like he did not understand like he couldn't comprehend what they were telling him so they ink the bottom of his feet and he walked down one end of the paper when Carlos got to the end of the paper and was re-inked instead of walking down the opposite end of the paper like he was instructed to do for whatever reason he just like walked over the prints he had just put down on the same side of that sheet of paper and it just really didn't make sense they kept trying to tell him what to do they kept instructing him and he was like oh i am i am i am but he wasn't like obviously he was trying to make his prints undetectable by walking over the prints he had just laid down so that it was like not clear enough for them to get a solid print from him for obvious reasons investigators felt that this was suspicious and they thought that perhaps Carlos had something to hide and that was the reason why he was not taking instructions. His prints were sent to the forensics lab for comparison. It was a difficult process since most of his prints were unclear, but after hours of hard work, they were finally able to get a clear print. The results came back and it was a match you guessed it the results from the palm print that was left on the tub also came back matching carlos's print so uh busted slight correction the palm print was found on the sink in the bathroom not on the side of the tub just wanted to put that out there because i know i said it wrong in the beginning not only that but carlos's dna also matched the dna found in christina's rape kit when confronted with a mountain of evidence against him, Carlos claimed that he had consensual sex with Christina that night and he had nothing to do with her murder. I guess he thought that's how he was going to explain the DNA found on her, but I mean, guy, come on. He said he had found Christina's body eight hours before Todd had discovered her and he was too afraid to call the police because he was a black man and he thought that they would pin it on him because of that. The race card, sir, really, right now? No, you do not get to do that. I'm sorry, sir, I really hate that shit. I do, I hate it with a passion. Lock his ass up and put him in jail for sure. It couldn't be because you actually committed the crime. No, no, no. When people do that, I'm just like, please don't. You know, it's just, it's not fair, it's not right, and it's not fair. Just don't do that. He insisted that he did not kill Christina and that he was at home with his children during those hours. Oh yeah, by the way, this man had children, okay? I mean, he should have been at home with his children. That's what he should have been doing. That ain't what he was doing though, and we know that based off of the evidence, but he should have been there. 
and now he's trying to use his kids as an alibi lord have mercy this man just keeps it just gets worse and worse and worse <laughs> like <laughs> can't with this guy and when police questioned his wife she oh yeah he had a wife too forgot that that little piece of information he had a wife too shameless shameless this man is shameless this is where a good chunk of shame would do a person well like i i do believe in healthy shame i do i do i think there's a type of shame that is very healthy for an individual to have and this man has zero zero and he had the audacity to get on his knees and pray to jesus when he was inside of that interrogation room you think jesus is listening to you think he gonna hear your prayer sir i think not Police questioned Carlos's wife and found out that she hadn't been home that night. She had actually been out visiting a relative in the town over. So he was home alone. And I guess he decided that this was his opportunity to go and do what he did to Christina. Now to be certain that Carlos was a killer, they needed to establish a motive. And this was really important to prosecutors to help build their case. They needed that motive because they didn't just need to prove that Carlos was the killer, but they needed to disprove that there was any other killers. It would be very easy for a jury to see why Jacob, Christina's abusive ex, would want her dead, but it wasn't so clear as to why Carlos would have wanted her dead, and they needed this to just piece the entire story together. So investigators did what any good investigators would do, and they went back to the crime scene for additional clues. Almost immediately, they saw something very peculiar in the hamburger buns that was left at the crime scene. The hamburger buns had these small indentations in them. They almost looked like ridges. And it appeared as though the buns had been smashed, like someone had stepped over them or something. The indentations and ridges in one of the buns looked like prints. And this is when they got the idea that possibly the killer may have stepped on the bun and maybe they would get even more of a solid scientific evidence. To study the indentations in the hot dog buns, forensic scientists used ultraviolet lighting along with light oblique angles. After examining the buns, they realized that they were looking at a toe print. They were also able to make out bits of the second and third toe. Rich details in the soft bread made it obvious that they were looking at someone's foot. The bread being soft enough to capture those types of details led investigators to believe that the buns were fresh and not stale because if the bread was a little bit stale, they would not have been able to capture the impressions so easily. I feel like I'm looking good, babe. Uh -huh. Prosecutors wanted to prove that without a reasonable doubt, Carlos was the one and only killer. And to do that, they had to exclude anyone else being at that crime scene outside of Carlos. If the toe impressions came back as someone other than Carlos, they would be screwed. They sent the buns to a certified latent print examiner. They just wanted to get a second opinion that would solidify what they had already thought. They just wanted that additional backing when they went to court to prosecute him. And the prints did in fact match Carlos Robinson. This was the proof prosecutors need that Carlos Robinson was in fact the one and only killer. Thanks to forensic science and some great police work, Carlos Robinson was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. What did you guys think about this case and my makeup look? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you like videos like these, you can check out some of my other videos. They'll be linked right here on the screen. Like, comment, subscribe, share all the amazing youtube -y things. And I will see you guys next time with another true crime story time. Bye. Now it's time for me to go celebrate my birthday, my every birthday. <laughs> Bye guys.